This lecture will go over electron configuration and orbital notation. Now, two things that you're going to want to have out when you are looking over this lecture is a periodic table. And then also in your work packet, you're going to see a piece of paper that has a chart on it that says principal energy level, number of orbitals present, total number of orbitals, and then on the other side it has a bunch of numbers and letters with a bunch of arrows going down to the bottom left. Make sure that you have both of those out because they are going to help with understanding of this lecture. So we're still talking about electrons here and when we learned about the different scientists, we learned about Bohr and how he had that planetary model that had electrons moving in orbits, kind of like planets going around the sun. But we learned later that the Bohr model is not really accurate because the electrons don't reside in these rings. So we do know that electrons are always in motion. Electrons are always moving. They don't just sit stationary. But they don't travel in those circular paths. So one word that we learned was orbitals. So electrons reside in these orbitals. And what an orbital is, is it's a three-dimensional space. And we were going to learn what these different spaces look like in this lecture. But Electrons can be predicted to be somewhere within this space at any given time. We don't really know the exact location, but we know that they are in, within this region. So before we even talk about electron configuration, we want to talk about quantum theory. And quantum theory is rooted in very advanced chemistry and physics, but we're just going to kind of skim the surface because it will help when you're understanding where these numbers and letters that we're going to be using come from. So all electrons are assigned four different quantum numbers. So the first is called the principal number, and we represent this by the letter N. So this tells us the energy level of the electron. Now if you remember back to when you did trends, we did discuss energy levels. Same thing that we're looking at here. So the value of N is going to range from 1 to 8. So it's in energy level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Those are our options. And if N equals 1, it means that it's one of the energy levels that is closest to the nucleus. So you can think about it being when we did trends about it being the ring that's closest to the nucleus, but now we know that it's not exactly a ring, but it's the same idea. Number two is called the angular number, and we represent this by the letter L. And this tells us the shape of the orbital. So it's either going to be S-shaped, P-shaped, D-shaped, or F-shaped. Now don't get confused because it does not look like a letter S, a letter P, a letter D, a letter F. Don't worry about where these letters come from. But these are the four possible shapes that we can have. The third number in quantum theory, or the third quantum number that we'll see, is the magnetic number. So this is the orientation of the orbital. So since these are three-dimensional shapes, we can think of them in terms of an, an X, a Y, and a Z axis. So if you think about math class and how you have an X, a Y, and a Z, that's what we're going to be looking at here. So the S orbital has one orientation. So if you look at the extra sheet of paper with the chart and the arrows that are on the back, 
take a look at that right now. So our S orbital has one orientation, and that is because the shape, so this goes back to your angle, angular number, the shape is a circle, so it's like a ball. Now, if you think about a ball, no matter which way I orient it or no matter which way I turn it, it's always going to be the same shape. So if you're thinking about a basketball or a volleyball or a baseball, every way that I turn it, it looks exactly the same because it is completely round. So that means that the S orbital only has one orientation. There's only one direction that we can view this. Now, the P orbital, if you're looking at your sheet, looks like a dumbbell. So it has, or a figure eight, if that makes more sense. It has an area at the top and it has an area at the bottom and it kind of comes together there at the center of your axis. This has three orientations and I'm going to show you kind of what that's going to look like. So our first option if we're looking at an axis here, would be for it to be going straight up and down. So kind of like it is on your picture. It's going vertical on your Y. It's not coming out of the page. So that's your first orientation. The second one would be for it to be going horizontal on your X. So not sticking out of the page. It's going on the X horizontally. I'm going to erase this first one here. And then our last orientation of the P is to actually, now this is going to look different than what it really is, this is actually coming out of the page. This one is on your Z axis. So imagine that dumbbell facing half of it's coming out the front of the page and the other half is coming out the back. Those are the three orientations or directions that that P orbital can be located in. Now, I will ask you to be able to draw the S orbital orientation, which is simply like this. You kind of want that centered. And then the three possible P orientations, it going on your Y, it going on your X, and then it coming through your Z. Then we have the D orbital, which is that double dumbbell shape. It has five possible orientations. Now, I'm not going to ask you to draw this, but there are five different directions that we could rotate that figure, and they would all be different, and it would have your orbitals in different physical locations, whether it was flat on the page, coming out at certain angles, but just know that the D has five. And the F orbital, which is that complex shape at the end, has seven different possibilities. So for the D and the F, just know that there's five possible and seven possible. You do not need to know how to draw them. But for the S orbital and the P orbital, you are going to want to be able to draw them. Number four, the fourth quantum number is the spin number. So each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. And electrons will move in opposite directions. Now, one way to think of that is electrons have both of, or all electrons have a negative charge, and negative charges are going to repel each other. So they are not going to want to move together. They're going to want to move opposite because they have the same charge. So that's your spin number. So those are our four. You have your principal number, which is your energy level, your angular, which is going to tell you the shape. Is it an S? Is it a P? Is it a D or an F? Your orientation, which is going to tell you what direction that orbital, that shape is in. And then your spin number tells you how many electrons you actually have. 
So some rules that we're going to talk about these that just kind of apply to the quantum numbers and will give us some guidelines when actually doing the electron configuration. These are named after the men, and yes, they're all men, that discovered these principles. The first is the Pali exclusion principle that says no two electrons will have the exact same quantum number, which means that no two electrons will be residing in the exact same space at the exact same time. Makes sense, right? Number two, or the second one, is the off-bow principle. And this says that electrons will fill the orbitals of the lowest energy level, which is that N, that principle number, first. So what does that mean? It means that the electrons are going to fill those orbitals that are closest to the nucleus and then move out. Well, we already know this, right? We learned about trends. We've learned about where the electrons go. So that's something we already knew, but now we can kind of apply that principle to it and we're going to apply where they actually are. And then the third is the Huns rule, which says that electrons will fill the orbitals singly first, so that means one, one at a time, and then they will double up. So if you remember with that spin number, it says each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. So they're going to fill in each orbital by themselves first, and then they'll double up. This one will make more sense when we do an example here in just a second. But just keep these in mind, be able to tell me what the rule is and the name of it. So actually to the electron configuration, this is really what the meat of the lecture is about. So electron configuration is going to show us and tell us the location of all electrons in an atom. So we are going to represent electrons by half arrows, and what I mean by that is it's going to look like this. So see how that's a half arrow? I don't have, I don't have the other side to the arrow. So you're only looking at the black part there. That's how we're going to draw the electrons, just like this. And orbitals are going to be represented by lines. So if I'm representing my S orbital, so I'm going to write it like this. Because the S only has one orientation, it only gets one line. The P has how many orientations? Take a look. Here we remember that X, Y, and Z orientation, so it's going to have three lines. Your D had five orientations, so it's going to have five lines. And then the F has seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so if you can remember that the lines represent the different orientations, then that's going to help you when drawing out your electron configuration. Alright, so now to some examples. So this is where we're going to take all of that information and we are going to put it all together. So the electron configuration and the orbital notation for oxygen. The first thing that you want to do is you want to determine the number of electrons. Now you're probably thinking how many electrons does it have? Is it an ion? But right now we're just going to simply discuss it is not an ion so it is neutral so you can go by your atomic number. So for oxygen we're going to have eight electrons and now we need to discuss where all of those electrons are. Now, if you're thinking about the rules that we just talked, the Pauli exclusion principle, the Aft-Bow principle, and Hund's rule, Aft-Bow principle says that electrons will fill orbitals of the lowest energy level first. Now, if you flip over that sheet of paper that had the pictures of the orbitals and it had that chart at the bottom. We're going to look at that one. It's the one with all those letters and numbers and the arrows. 
we're going to use this. This is going to show you the order of the orbitals. You are not going to be able to use this on your quiz, but once you get practice with this, you're not even going to need this chart. So the way this goes is you're going to start reading at the 1S, and you're going to follow the arrow. Once you get to the bottom of the arrow and there's nothing left, you start at the top right of the next line. So we're going to go from 1S, and then there's nothing there. We go to the next line, 2S, there's nothing there. We go to the next line, 2P, then we go to 3S, and then there's nothing there. So we go to the next line. So you kind of get the point. So you're going diagonal from the top right to the bottom left, and then you just continue to repeat that cycle. So, oxygen has eight electrons. So the first orbital that we're going to have is the 1s orbital. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line that says 1s. And now, the electrons, by Hund's rule, will fill this orbital singly first, which means it goes up, and then it's going to double up. Well, we need eight electrons to be accounted for, so we're going to fill this entire orbital. So this accounts for one, two of my electrons. So... Following your finger on the chart, after 1s, we go to 2s. So we're going to draw a line. Remember that our s only has one line. And then we're going to do the same thing in there. We're going to fill it up. So that accounts for four of my electrons. But we need eight. So three and four. And now after 2s, we go to 2p. Now, remember that P has one, two, three lines. So we can just write this as being 2P. So now is where we're going to go the singly part first. So that's going to go up, up, up. So now I have one, two, three, four that we've already filled here. Five, six. 7, and I need one more, so now I'm going to double up, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is my electron configuration. Easy enough, right? Count your arrows, and you go with it. So that's my electron configuration. Now, there's another thing that you're going to want to write. So this... is my electron configuration. And now we're going to want to also do what's called orbital notation. So orbital notation is just writing out what we have and it's kind of taking those quantum numbers and condensing them together. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to write your energy level of the first one you have, which is a 1. I got that from here. Then you're going to write your angular number, which is right here. And then you tell me how many you have in that orbital. And we have 2, and you're going to write that as an exponent. Done. Now you move on to your next one. It's 2s. How many do we have? We have 2. Done. You move on to your next one, 2p. How many do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4. Exponent is 4. And that is your orbital notation. All right? That's it. So let's do another example. So I'm going to erase this. So if you need this still, go ahead and pause it. So the next one that we're going to do is calcium. So if you're looking at your periodic table, you got to first find out how many electrons we need to account for, and that's 20. So 
We're going to do the same thing that we did before. Start with your 1S, that's the first thing on our line. And we need 20, so we know we're going to fill both of these. After 1S, follow your arrows. We go to 2S. You're going to fill both of those. That's four. We still need a lot more. Then we go to 2P. Remember, your P has three lines. Fill them singly first, then double up. So now we have how many? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Still need more. We need 20. After 2P, if you follow your arrow down to the bottom left, you're going to go to 3S. Now we have 12. Then we're going to go to 3P because we're starting on our next arrow. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And then follow down to 4S, 1920. All right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's your electron configuration. And now your orbital, just writing out your letters, writing out your numbers and how many. 1s2, that one's done. 2s2, that one's done. 2p1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that one's done. 3s2, 3p1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 4s2. Easy as that. So here are two examples that I would like for you to go ahead and try on your own. Pause the video and then come back and we will review the answers. All right, so here's your answer for selenium. Selenium has 34 electrons. Now, if there were problems on your answer, some places where there might have been would have been this spot right here because you had to remember that the D has five orbitals, so it can hold 10 electrons. And then also here, making sure that you're filling your orbitals singly and then doubling up instead of having two in the first one and then maybe you had two in the second one, and then this one may have been empty. Just make sure that you're having, you're filling them up singly and not. So you have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, and 4p4. So that is selenium. All right, here's your answer for zinc. So zinc fills up everything completely, so nothing will be moving singly. Everything is doubled up. You're at 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and 3d10. So there are some practice worksheets. Once you get through the first one, the rest of them will kind of show you some shortcuts. So... We start out with the long way first, but there are some shortcuts that make this a lot shorter and something that will help so you don't have to use that arrow chart. But go ahead and try these and check your answers and good luck.